Good morning and welcome to Communication and Coffee. I am your host today, Professor Kylie Becker of Eastern Arizona College. So today we are going to talk about chapter one and three and four technically in our public speaking textbook, um, the OER public speaking project. I'll have a link down below. So let us go ahead and get started. So, well, here's the textbook for chapter one. Like I said, I'll put the link, um, but let's go ahead and talk about public speaking, some basic kind of tenets of it, and why is it important? So just kind of the basics. So what is communication? You know, and what is then public communication and public speaking? So communication at its most basic is something that we do every day. It's literally just sending and receiving messages, hopefully in an effective and appropriate manner, because we can definitely communicate in a way that is not effective or appropriate um, or beneficial or good in any way, shape, or form. And public communication then is just doing so within a public context, such as at a wedding speech or a funeral eulogy, or you're giving a big presentation to your peers at work, or you have to give a talk at church. So what are some benefits of being able to be an effective public speaker? You know, what are some situations where you might use public speaking? You know, I just gave you a list. You know, at some point, a lot of us are going to be in a wedding. Maybe we're the maid of honor, the best man, and have to give a speech. Um, you know, at some point we'll probably attend a funeral and maybe we have to give the eulogy. Um, so those might be some more personal reasons we would do that. Um, more professional reasons, if you're trying to sell a product or sell the idea of a product to your coworkers, and then in public, um, PR managers, even police officers, all do some form of public speaking. Okay, so just kind of basic overview what does communication actually look like and some words to know before we really get into that is encoding so you're taking an idea that you have in your head and you're turning it into words decoding so the other person is taking your words what you said and then turning that idea into a mental image so if i say chair you know i have to think in my head first i'm imagining a chair then i say chair you take that word and you imagine you know, definitely not the same chair because I'm staring at my kitchen chair right now and it's probably different than yours. Um, but you turn it into that mental image. Communicator. So the people in an interaction, sorry, the cat behind me, she's pulling at the... <laughs> Anyways, so the communicators are all the people in an interaction. The message is anything that has meaning um, and it can be intentional or not. So it can be verbal, it can be nonverbal. So the way I dress sends a message. Um, the fact that the cat was clawing at the curtains in the background can send a message even though it was not intentional. Um, your accent can have a message in it. Um, and then your messages are sent through a particular channel, which is your means of communicating. So the channel can be voice, it can be electronic, um, it can be through a text, through Facebook message, through Instagram, DM, whatever. Um, noise, so that can be anything that is distracting from the message, so it can be physical noise, um, like there's literally a jackhammer outside, it can be physiological noise, maybe it's too cold in the room, maybe you're hungry, uh, maybe it's the fact that on the video there was the curtain like flopping behind someone. Um, even cultural differences can be considered noise if it's distracting from the message. Um, or if someone has a very, very strong accent or uses um, jargon or slang or words you're maybe not familiar with, that can also be considered noise. And then our worldview. So how we see, interpret, and think about the world. So for an example, would be like our epistemology. So how do we know the things we know? That's part of our worldview. Um, and obviously everyone grows up in different households in different countries, speaking different languages with different um, religious beliefs or lack thereof. So everyone's going to bring a different worldview into whichever situation you're in. And you have to find the best way to communicate with individual people based on their worldview. 
ah, first sip in the morning. So the first actual model we're going to talk about, so what communication quote unquote looks like is the linear model. So it's basically just what it looks like. The sender sends a message through a particular channel, which might be voice, Instagram, whatever. And the receiver just gets the message and that's pretty much it. Um, I like to talk about the hypodermic dart or bullet theory of communication when we talk about linear model. Um, because the bullet theory was really big back in the day when we were talking about persuasion and the effect of media. So that would just say, you know, I send a message through a channel and, you know, so the other person just does it. So if I tell my roommate, okay, we're going to go steal a car, they just are like, okay, we're going to go steal a car. Obviously, that's not really how life works and how communication works. So nowadays we have this much better model, um, which is the transactional model, which says communication is more of an ongoing circular process. Um, there's two different models here basically saying the same thing. So there's the two communicators in a situation, but you have the context around it. So you have the physical and psychological context. So physically, where are you? Mentally, where are you? What's the social context? Is there a relational context? Because you're not going to tell the same story to your best friend as you do to your great grandmother. You may tell them, it's like, oh, I went out and did this thing, but your friend is probably going to get a lot more detail or a lot different detail depending on the type of event this was. And also the cultural context. Um, because in some cultures, some things are acceptable, but in other cultures, they'd be considered weird. So in some countries, you know, where you greet each other by kissing the other person on the cheeks, you know, that's very normal. Um, but if someone came up to the U.S. and just tried to do that to a quote unquote, you know, regular average American, then that person might be considered strange and put that communication situation maybe off on the wrong foot. Um, but of course, there's also noise and stuff in it. As you can see, we have our little noise going around. So things that might be distracting from this overall um, communication situation. Obviously, you have the feedback going back and forth because you're always giving feedback, whether it's through your body language, through your tone of voice, through how you um, maintain eye contact. With the context, Alan K. Context is worth 80 IQ points. So, particularly for public speaking, we have 11 speaking competencies that we're going to talk about. So, first one Do you have a useful topic? Is it something interesting? Um, can it be applicable to the people that you're talking to? Do you have an engaging introduction? Um, I really try to hammer this into my students because if you don't get their attention, then, you know, they're not going to care. Um, I have a lot of people who try to start out with just, you know, hi, my name is Kylie. I'm going to talk to you today about insert whatever here. That's not particularly engaging. Um, so can you make people care about your topic? Can you tell a really fun story? Um, can you start it off with, you know, perhaps a joke? And then some people are just really naturally talented and they can just walk up to the room and, you know, all eyes are on them and they can just start talking and everyone's like, oh, wow, this is great. Most of us do not have that capability, unfortunately. Uh, do you have clear organization? Is everything structured in a way that it makes sense and it flows well and people can follow what you're saying without having to be like, oh my gosh, I have no idea what just like, where did they get this point from? Do you have well-supported ideas? Can you do good research? Can you remember to say your citations out loud so that people know where your information's coming from? Do you actually have closure in conclusion? So do you kind of bring it back to your intro, wrap everything up with a nice little bow, and not introduce any new topics while you're trying to close off? Do you use clear and vivid language? So is the language you're using appropriate for the topic that you are talking about? Suitable vocal expression. Are you varying your vocal tone or are you just sitting there talking in monotone, super boring like we all had that one teacher in high school do? 
Uh, do you have corresponding nonverbals? So does your body language, your facial expression, how you're dressed um, match up with the topic that you're talking about? Because if you're talking about something that's, you know, a little on the more serious side, um, such as, you know, overdose race, rates in your county, then you're probably not going to be all super cheerful and happy and, you know, all bubbly and bouncy because, you know, it's a serious, you know, topic. But if you're talking about how to plan a child's birthday party or hire a clown, you're not going to be sitting there very solemn and serious, right? Is your speech adapted to your audience? So do you know who you're talking to and can you tailor what you're talking about to them? So one of the exercises we do in my class is the students, they choose their topic. Um, probably, I think we typically do this for persuasive. So they tell me what they're talking about for their persuasive. So for example, if one of my students is talking about, you know, why Bigfoot's real or why we should believe in Bigfoot, they get randomly assigned an audience. So maybe they have to persuade businessmen that, Bigfoot is real and why they need to care. So that's kind of an impromptu adapted to audience, but typically you'll do an audience analysis so that um, you kind of know who you're talking to. Do you have adept use of visual aids? So basically, can you make a pretty PowerPoint or pretty Prezi or do a nice video or insert whatever here that would make it visually appealing? And then convincing persuasion. So when you are trying to persuade people of something, do you actually do it well? Or do you use lots of fallacies or illogical arguments that, you know, on the surface may look all nice and pretty, but don't actually, you know, work or make sense? So obviously this is not a live stream, so I can't answer your questions or comments, um, you know, right now, but if you leave a comment, then I can find you an answer. So we're, we're skipping chapter two because for the public speaking project, um, chapter two is, um, it's kind of, it's about history and stuff. And yeah, I mean, Socrates is great and all, but I don't really want to talk about him. <laughs> okay, so chapter three is ethics in public speaking. Um, ethics and morality are obviously very, very related, but it's not, they're not quite the same. Um, this book tends to make a difference between it saying morality is more um, what is right or wrong and ethics is decision making within a dilemma. So morality, I see it as more of what you should do and then ethics is the actual decision that you make. Um, but you should try for ethical and moral decisions. Um, different cultures religions and even individuals typically have somewhat different standards in regards to morals and ethics. Um, I think most people would agree that it's morally wrong to, you know, just walk up and punch someone in the face for no reason or to murder someone. But that doesn't mean that's how everyone always acts or that there might not be um, exceptions to that rule within an ethical dilemma. Um, but in regards to public speaking, ethical speaking isn't just during the speech itself. You don't have to, well, you do. Okay, let me read with it. You don't have to be ethical just when you are up in front speaking. It's part of the process of going about it. Okay. Um, but being an ethical communicator, you are trying to understand and respect other communicators and other people before evaluating and responding. So you are aiming for understanding rather than just kind of that off the cuff, you know, oh, well, you're wrong because of blah, 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 blah. Try to actually see where they're coming from beforehand. So some ethical guidelines, particularly for public speaking, obviously be honest and avoid plagiarism. So don't fudge statistics, don't try to lie, you know, don't misquote people and avoid plagiarism by citing. For the love of all that is good in this world, cite your sources. If you use information from another place or another person, just give credit where credit is due. 
For my class, we use APA, as does all of the communication disciplines. So if you cite, cite an APA because MLA is weird. Don't tell the English department I said that. Um, set responsible speech goals. So are your goals ethical? You're not trying to cheat anyone out of their money. You're not trying to get them to invest in something that's not really, you know, good. So, you know, be appreciative of differences. Don't try to go out and attack people just because they're different than you or because they believe Bigfoot's not real and you believe Bigfoot is real. Um, be socially aware. And the big thing for me is employ respectful free speech. Um, you know, as of this time, I live in America. I am an American and free speech is something that um, is very valuable. You know, you can say whatever you want. You can have whatever kind of belief you want. Um, but you have to also respect that in others and say, you know, I may not agree with you. In fact, maybe I vehemently disagree with you and think that you're wrong, but you still have a right to say what you believe, particularly if you can back it up with facts and data that are from good unbiased sources. And then ethical listening and feedback. So you're actually listening to listen. You're not listening to just respond. So you're interpreting and analyzing what the person is saying. Um, you're not prejudging them based on, you know, your first gut instinct of, oh, they look funny or they dress weird or, you know, they have X, Y, Z that is different from me. You're not distracted by avoidable stimuli. So, you know, for my class, that means put your phone on silent and put it in your backpack because that is an avoidable stimuli. Uh, and you provide feedback that helps the person improve their skills. So when you give feedback, it's not just like, oh, you were great or, you know, you suck. It's, you know, hey, you did really good at this, but I noticed maybe you could use some improvement on this aspect of speaking. So any questions, comments, leave them down below. And one thing to think of as you go about just like in daily life, how do you practice being an ethical listener? So what do you do that allows you to actually listen and try to understand people rather than just uh, judging them or not thinking things through all the way? Because sometimes people say things and we have this visceral gut reaction of, I don't like that or I don't agree with that. So how do you go about combating those things and saying, I don't agree with this, but I want to understand where you're coming from so that next time I come across a situation, I can engage in discussion and I can learn from them and then they can learn from me. Okay. So chapter four, <laughs> that awkward moment when you've already said, what? Multiple times and still have no idea what the person said. Honestly, that's me a lot, but also I probably just have really selective hearing. Um, or I'm listening to something in my head. So hearing is just literally the airwaves vibrating in our eardrums. It's a physiological response. Listening, however, is something very different. Um, it's paying conscious attention to actually what you are hearing and what is going on. So, you know, if you're sitting in the student union, you may hear other conversations going on because that's what happens, um, but you might not be listening to them because then that turns into eavesdropping, right? Okay. So there's actually different types of listening. Um, there's appreciative listening. So if you're listening to music, if you're watching a play or watching the theater, watching television, any form of entertainment, um, like a podcast, those can be appreciative listening because you're listening, obviously, to appreciate, to enjoy. Um, there is relational or empathetic listening. So a, a listening to a friend in distress um, complain about their day or try to work through something would be empathetic listening because you are listening to build that relationship up and listening to be empathetic. Uh, one of the subsets of that is therapeutic listening. So if you go see a therapist or a counselor, they are engaging in therapeutic listening to help you help yourself solve whatever issue that you may be having. Um, there's comprehensive listening or informational. I prefer comprehensive um, just because I think of it as 
Comprehensive listening, you are listening to comprehend, you are listening to understand. So in class, you know, all of your teachers hope that you are engaging in comprehensive listening um, because you are trying to understand the material. Or if one of your friends is trying to give you directions to their house, you know, turn left at the second glacier, you are trying to understand how to get to this specific place. And one of the subsets of that is critical listening. So listening to make a judgment. So political speeches, you are listening to try to choose which candidate you want to vote for. We are engaging in critical listening, hopefully, when someone is trying to sell us something. So if we're at the car dealership and you know, so-and-so is trying to sell us this nice new Ford Fiesta, um, we are listening to what they're saying to say, you know, is this a good car for me? Is this something I want to buy? Can I afford this? What are the pros, the cons? Um, you've probably been hammered on the benefits of listening for your entire life, but you know, really it, it's true. Um, you do get better grades when you're listening and actually focusing because you understand better. You can gain an appreciation for differences. So if you actually try to listen and understand people from different cultures and different backgrounds, then you realize that, you know, it's okay that not everyone's the same or people from other cultures, you know, have something of value to um, share. You can be more productive. Like if you actually know what you're doing, you spend less time trying to figure it out and you can get more done. And particularly with friends, you can be better connected because if our friends aren't listening to us, if they don't care, then we're not going to be friends with them for very long, right? So the three A's of active listening are attention, attitude, and adjustment. Obviously, attention, you're focused on what you're listening to. You know, your attitude's also very important. You know, so a lot of people might go into a class or whatever, for example, saying, oh, this is a waste of time. I just have to take it because it's a gen ed. This is going to suck. And yeah, if you go into it with that attitude, it's probably going to be a little sucky. But if you go into it more of an attitude of, you know, what can I learn? What can I get out of this? How can this help me in my goals? You are going to be a lot better off. And then adjustment. So be flexible. So maybe someone says something you weren't expecting and now you have to adjust to that and say, okay, well, this is not where I thought this was going. Let me, you know, refocus my thoughts. I'm um, going to try not to anticipate what the speaker is going to say, because then maybe you get off on a little thought tangent, or maybe you're starting to get worked up, worked up because you know, it's like, oh, I know they're going to talk about this and I have a response for that, but they might not. <laughs> Barriers to effective listening anticipating, which we just talked about, because it distracts you. Um, and typically, if people are big anticipators, they're listening to respond rather than listening to understand. Um, judging, don't jump to conclusions, you know, just based on how someone looks or how they talk, um, you know, what they wear. You know, if someone walks in for their speech in my class in a mini skirt, I'm thinking, Okay, you know, not going to judge them for that because maybe it's relevant to their speech, and, you know. And then try not to react emotionally, particularly in regards to persuasive speaking, because once your emotion is involved, your active listening, it pretty much stops. Once you become emotionally invested, any chance of thinking critically is kind of just woo, gone out the window by the wayside. You know, you're caught in your head trying to poke holes in the speaker's argument. So maybe I'm a very firm believer that Bigfoot exists. And, you know, Jack in my class is trying to persuade me that Bigfoot does not exist because he is a very firm believer that Bigfoot does not exist and that it is wrong to believe in Bigfoot. You know, I hear that and I'm thinking, oh, Jack, what are we going to do with you? How am I going to convince you that Bigfoot actually does exist? Oh, where, where's all my evidence at? I got to pull it up so after class I can, you know, show it all to you and, you know, try my hardest to convince you. Nah, just calm yourself, take a deep breath and say, okay, I may not agree with Jack. I think Jack is wrong. 
but I'm going to give him a chance to explain his point because, you know, maybe he can give me some of the oppositional points and I can, you know, next time this issue comes around, I can say, yeah, I've heard that your side believes this. However, I have evidence that shows that maybe this isn't totally as correct as you thought it was. Something to think about. So some strategies for being an effective listener. You know, basically just keep an open mind. Um, it's the big thing. You know, there's you know, 7 billion or something like that people in this world. You know, everyone knows something that you do not. Everyone has some form of information that you don't. So just keep that in mind. Identify distractions that um, are you think will affect you, that are going to happen or may happen. So cell phones, notifications. So maybe mute it, turn it on silent, slip it somewhere where it's not going to be right there and distracting you. You know, come prepared if possible. So maybe you come prepared with questions. If you know what people's topics are going to be, come prepared with some, you know, thoughts, you know, written down and any preliminary questions you might have because they might get answered in the speech. And then take notes to help focus on main ideas if it's something that you really want to get stuck into your brain. So speakers, we've been talking a lot about how the audience can get stuff done, but what can a speaker do to help people listen better? First things first, make them care. If they don't care, they're not going to focus. They're not going to listen at all. Get them to engage with you. So this might be as simple as <laughs> getting them to stand up or passing out something at the beginning and saying, hey, we're going to take this little preliminary survey and at the end we're going to do it again and see maybe if I have uh, changed your opinion at all. Repeat your main point two to three times. So if you say it once, people probably forget twice. People might remember three times and you're pretty solid. Establish the why and get them curious. So why should these students care about if Bigfoot is real or not? Maybe your area tends to have a lot of Bigfoot sightings and you live in a community where a lot of people get outside. So if they encounter Bigfoot, you want them to be safe. Um, and get them engaged, like I said, by moving physically. So maybe stand up, you know, stretch, get a couple jumping jacks. It works particularly well with speeches about why you should be physically active. Um, but you can also do that to, you know, maybe just have them stand up and shake, you know, someone's hand in the class who they don't know. So just overall be aware of the verbal and nonverbal feedback that you are getting and the ones that you are, or that you are giving and receiving. And are you using them effectively and appropriately? So some concept checks for this uh, couple chapters. What are some things that you think make an ineffective speaker? And then how can you as a speaker not do those things? You know, how can you be an ethical listener while listening to something that you disagree with? You know, what can you do to make sure that you are, you know, doing well? And then how should you use nonverbals to communicate that you're paying attention to who's ever speaking? Obviously, you know, if you're sitting like this, probably not showing that you're paying attention. Um, so maybe you sit more like this. <laughs> okay. um, so like I said, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, leave a comment down below. I will try to get back to you. Um, but I am a full-time professor, and YouTube is not my main career. Um, but if you are in my class at EAC, then feel free, like I said, just shoot me an email, um, shoot me a Canvas message. Thanks.